feature. So uh, at the end only, um, once we're in the Q&A section of the presentation, if you'd rather ask your question via audio, you can use the raise your hand feature and Lander and I will see that and we can uh, loop you in and, and turn you on so that you can ask Jim um, directly. So those are the couple of ways that we're going to engage here. And if there's other technical questions, go ahead and ask those in the chat as well. And I'll be monitoring that as we go along in case you need anything. So I think that's it. Awesome. Should I start? Is that my cue? You're on. That's my cue. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, you'll find that my approach is very casual and relaxed. And among naturalists, it's, it's a nice fit. So uh, we're just going to have a nice kind of free-flowing narrative on loons. And I'll see, I start off with a picture of the book that uh, came out just this summer. And as I was mentioning to Lander and Julia, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears goes into writing a book. And I can't believe the number of re rewrites and editorial comments and back and forths. And the book in my mind had been written for about two years before it kind of finally got to press. So I literally needed to reread the book to just like, what, what did I write? Cause it, it was like almost two years cause it was such a long time ago. But I tried to write the book from my perspective as a biologist who's been studying loons for almost three decades. Uh, I tried to bring everybody up to date on what's the current research. And along the way, tell some stories that hopefully make the book a little interesting and make, make you want to kind of flip through the chapters. So this talk's going to be about 40 to 45 minutes, someplace in there. And then there'll be time for questions and answers as we go through. So just some real brief background on myself is essentially kind of unknown to most everybody there. So I've been studying loon since 1993. And this is a map of North America where I've studied loons. And the number there represents the number of field seasons I've been at a location. And a field season during migration might be as little as two weeks. In the winter time, it might be four months long or in the breeding season, it might be four months long, for example. And I've worked at many other places for just one field seasons, but those where I've spent multiple seasons, uh, I included on this map. So 12, for example, in the Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, that's kind of where I'm from originally three seasons in Saskatchewan, two in Alaska, three in Washington, two in Nevada, two in Southern California, seven in South Carolina, or seven off the coast of Louisiana, five off the South Carolina, and six in New England, predominantly off the coast of Maine. And this is what I looked like back in 1993. It's when I used fertilizer. And today, a few, few things have changed since then. So, so I'm just gonna briefly do a Loon 101 a uh, couple of things. Then a loon researcher's toolkit. I thought that might be useful for people to just see like how we go about studying loons. And then I'll share with you some findings along the way interspersed with those toolkits. And then at the end, I'm just gonna say a few things about loon anatomy is just kind of getting us a bit into the book. So most of us love loons, they need no introduction. We can just show pictures of loons and we would probably all be happy, right? We, we don't even need narrative. We can listen to vocalizations and we would be in heaven. So I feel very blessed to have studied this bird for as long as I have. The environments where the bird takes me has been a real blessing. In, in Europe, they're known as the great northern diver. So most of us recognize them as common loons, but in Europe, they're known as the great northern diver. And really it's a large bird. It's almost like the moose of the deer, deer, deer world. So they're eight to 16 pounds. They're diving birds and they're piscivores. So they feed predominantly on fish. Traits, some of those are pretty self-evident. You know, the toes are webbed, the fourth toe is elevated and unwebbed. They have 14 to 15 neck vertebrae, 22 to 23 secondaries and, and a unique group. And they're along with four other species. So the Arctic loon on the top left there, the Pacific loon on the top right, the yellow-billed loon on the bottom left, and the red-throated loon on the bottom right. So those are four other species of loons. Most of those breed up in Alaska and across you know, Eurasia. So when we're looking at breeding loons with their stark plumage, just their basic breeding distribution is predominantly across Canada 
and the northern states that border Canada. So Washington, Montana, Dakota, Minnesota, for example, and New England. And then the loons winter predominantly along marine environments along the coast, as far down into Mexico. Many remain off the coast of Alaska, off Nova Scotia and Labrador, Maine, for example. And then they migrate, in some cases, far distances. Some populations migrate just a short distance. And in the wintertime, they molt. And so sometimes loons have a different appearance than what we see in the breeding, uh, breeding range. Uh, they lack the checkerboard back, the distinct necklace, for example. And they can just kind of fit into the background and oftentimes get overlooked. So people are interested, like, what's the ancestry of loons? And it would be great, right, if we could just go into loonancestry.com and get the answer. But uh, it doesn't quite work that way. So we, we look at genetics and we try to figure out the story looking at the fossil record. So all the genus Gavia that we think of the five species, all their fossils go back to 2.6 million years ago to present time. So it pushes us back about that far. Ancestral Gavia, so the ancestors of today's modern loons between five and 23 million years ago and before that, there was another bird fossil that called, was called Columboides, was common throughout Europe and parts of North America as well. And probably a little smaller than our modern day loon in the feet, not as far back as we see. So this is a picture of Columboides. And so the question is like, what came before that? And, and really we don't have a definitive answer to that. We do know that there were a number of diving birds that were quite large during the Cretaceous. There was an interior seaway, and you can find fossils of extraordinarily animals in the North American continent, like, for example, Cretaceous diving birds in North Dakota, parts of Montana, and that's because of this interior seaway. So I think loons probably came from the ocean originally and then became freshwater, became more landlocked, and then they kept migrating to the ocean. So loons have a salt gland, and they're very comfortable, for example, in the ocean. Okay, so that's Loon 101. We're all done, we, we all passed. So I thought it would be interesting to, like as a biologist to take a look at this photograph and then we can try to ask ourselves, like do we, can we separate those individuals confidently? Like if they started inter, intermingling, would we be able to follow them? And it's almost like looking at two chickadees, two blue jays. It's like, who's who? Who's... And again, if we, don't, if we can't confidently identify them, we end up guessing, right? And so we need to figure out a way how we can confidently identify these birds. So is, which one's the male, which one's the female? Was it the same pair as last year? Did they came back to the same territory? And unless we have some way of marking these individuals, you know, our body of knowledge about these was gonna be hampered. So this is kind of where the story really begins. Dave Evers, for his master's degree project, in the late 1980s was trying to figure out a way how to catch loons. My connection with Dave is we were college roommates like seven years previous to his master's degree. So I knew Dave and he called me out and I was in California. So I flew to Michigan and tried to work with Dave in the early 90s to figure out a technique how to catch loons. So I give Dave all the credit figuring out how to work on this. There was a previous loon researcher, Judy McIntyre had done some night lighting as well. So basically you go out in a, in a boat at night, you have a marine battery, you have a bright light attached to it, and you might play a chick distress call, like sounds something like this, and I'm not the world's best at it, something like that, there you go. And the idea is that the adults will turn around and they come towards the boat because they hear the chick. And parental instinct is so strong, they'll actually turn and swim towards the boat and you're just idling slowly and you scoop it up with a large dip net. So that's kind of really the technique that's worked and it's been really successful. So then once you have the loon in the net, you bring it into the boat, you kind of wrestle with it for a while. And then as a scientist, you're gonna to try to take measurements. So you might wanna weigh the bird, bill measurements, wing measurements, body measurements, you can imagine leg measurements. And then you might as well take tissue samples, so blood and feathers, and you can look at those later for just natural blood chemistries, for example, like how much cholesterol, sugar, glucose might they have, 
but also you can look for toxins, maybe lead, mercury in the environment, for example. But ultimately what really Dave was trying to get at was come away to a band, a common loon. And by putting a unique color combination on the leg foot, it allowed us to identify individuals. And that really was the breakthrough because once we were able to consistently catch loons, this opened up the floodgates. And literally at that point, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. And that's really where our knowledge of loons took off because now we can ask, how do they come back to the same territory? Do they come back to the same pair? How old do they live? If they disperse, where do they disperse to? So these are all things we've been able to find out and we have basically elim eliminated guessing. So these were now some fundamental questions about the biology of the bird that we were able to answer confidently. And just to kind of continue with just a minute with this. So Dave started a company, Biodiversity Research Institute, and his passion has been banding loons. I've been with Dave in the field. Uh, I kind of got my training from him. Just him and his team, ended up working all, all nights for weeks, for months, for years, and decades of banding birds. And uh, if I can use an analogy, Forrest Gump, when Forrest Gump was a running fool from one coast to the other coast, if you saw the movie, and I just felt like running. Well, I don't want to put Dave necessarily in the cat, that category, but just him and his team just banded loons. That's all they did. And I was, one season I was with them in 1997. We caught loons all throughout New England, Ontario, Quebec, we, all we did was ban loons all night. We, we didn't even sleep. You go three months, you're just like, oh my gosh. Ugh. And we just banded birds. And so now Dave and his group has over 5,000 loons banded. And they've been monitoring those loons for literally one or two decades or more. So that's kind of where lots of information comes from. And there's other researchers that Dave helped train in Wisconsin that have worked equally hard and done a tremendous job in this area as well. So my doctoral dissertation was following these first banded birds and trying to document what they did every day. And so working with a bunch of uh, volunteers and data sheets, we just went out, looked at banded birds. Did they stay together? How far did they move apart? Who sat on the nest? What was, what was their patterns? Who fed the young? How often? Did anyone write in the back of the adult? Was it the male? Was it the female? And these were just a whole panoply of questions that we were able to ask. And literally, we worked from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. So we worked 18 hours consecutively, day after day, all summer, pair after pair. It really was a monumental effort. And, and, and again, we're naturalists. So as a field biologist, I can't even tell you the number of mosquitoes, black flies, horse flies, deer flies, just, you just have to learn how to cope with it because that's, that's your environment. And I think that goes to territory, just being a field biologist. So what did we discover? Well, one that, you know, loons do not mate for life. The longest pair stay together 17 years, but they stay about six, seven years on average. So that's kind of the average time. And an adult might have two or three partners during its lifetime. Males seem to do a little better than females. Females seem to have a little lag time. We do know some loons are over 30 years old. Some are over 35 years old. And we're gonna keep monitoring that just to see what that upper limit is. We do know a number of loons have died between 20 and 30 years of all age. So maybe that's more middle or late middle age. And maybe these birds that are over 30 might be the exception. So with more data, that story is gonna be more complete, but that's, more or less where, where that story is. Now the chicks return to the natal area and the thinking of it is that, and, and why there might be selection for that because the, the chicks can disperse further and go to a new lake. But if the lake was successful, rearing young, had enough food, had shelter, had a good site to build a nest, it almost seems selection would favor you to return back to that area. And so sure enough, chicks tend to go back to the area where they were born or disperse nearby. Typically they wouldn't disperse too far, you know, generally a few miles. And then they would try to set up shop in time. So our understanding of acoustics has really changed 
and grown tremendously because we have banded birds. So we know who all the neighbors are. We know if there's a bird that's not from the po local population. And this is a bird giving a yodel call. And I'm just gonna play a yodel call for us just briefly. So what you're hearing there, there's like three introductory notes and then there's repeat phrases after that. So let's look at some neighbor stranger experiments that some researchers did. So this is looking at a sonogram of a, a loon yodel. And remember, this is the male's territorial song. This is, I'm announcing, this is my territory, I'm here to defend it. So we see those initial phrases, those three notes that go up, those are the introductory notes. And then we see that up and down those repeat phrases over duration, over time, like 10 seconds is the axis on the bottom. And so loons know all the males in the area, which they could hear, generally within several miles. And if you take one of those loons away and put a stranger there and play the call, what does the resident male do upon hearing a new one? Well, if we look at a sonogram, we might make a prediction that might change its tunes in some ways. And what they did, right, is they, they had more repeat motifs showing probably motivation and intent that I recognize there's a new bird in the area. I'm not too happy with that. I'm willing to defend my territory. And they essentially alter their tune, right, where there's more repeat phrases. So our interpretation of that is the bird on the bottom is highly motivated to alert others that I'm, I'm on territory and I'm willing to defend from uh, any other loons. And there's been, I have a whole chapter on acoustics in the book trying to summarize our new information. Now, this might be surprising and, uh, you know, Julia, you had Star Wars there and I, I'm just gonna talk about Star Wars. There's like the dark side of the loon that we don't like to talk about. And that's the dark, Darth Vader aspect is loons can be uber aggressive towards other loons, like super aggressive, hyper aggressive, and they'll chase other loons. And some of that is just a young male and possibly a female just trying to gain access to a territory. And so it might challenge a resident male, for example. And the resident male is gonna defend its territory because I, I'm gonna lose my investment if I go to another lake. So male residents will defend against young birds, for example, and oftentimes there's these very intense battles. Now this is the sternum or the breastplate of a loon, and we notice there's holes in there. And this photograph came from Mark Pokras, a uh, wildlife vet at Tufts University. And so Mark was kind of putting the story together. Mark has done over 3,000 loon necropsies and an expert in loons in so many levels and a great guy. Well, Mark put the story together that is, this, is, this is the loon bill, right? These are loon bills that are coming underneath the loon, puncturing the breastplate and potentially killing them. And so, the, and what he found of interesting that half of the loons had sternal punctures and both males and females had them. So typically we think males were just aggressive, but it seems to be females might be just as aggressive as males. And he found that the average sternum had about seven holes in it. So it shows you this is a real threat. So when loons are peering or on the surface, part of what they're peering for would be an intruder loon, for example. And loons occasionally practice infanticide. So this would be a rogue loon moving into the territory of an established pair, grabbing its chick and trying to drown it. And you might think like, why would you do that? Well, typically what could happen is in a very emotional pair bond where they lose a young one, that pair oftentimes might go separate ways. And the loon that committed the act of infanticide might be able to try to gain access to that territory. So that's our understanding of this. Uh, it's not common, but it's been observed. I observed it in 1993, for example, on a lake in Michigan. Okay, so after doing breeding loons for around 10 years, I must admit I was looking for something different and studying loons in the winter was just perfect. This is the New Orleans skyline. 
And if you want to want to study loons in the winter time, like are there any different tools I need to use? And I wanted to show you this because loons do molt, as I mentioned earlier, and you can't separate adults from young, young of the year. So the young of the year on the bottom have a more scalloped appearance. Their feathers are more fringed and adults have less fringing and a more square notch. So that's how you can tell adult from a young loon on the ocean. So I started putting out radio telemetry units on loons. So this is attached and glued directly to the band. And then I'm able using a receiver to track loons and figure out where they're going, for example. Because in the ocean, it's a much larger area, for example, than on a lake uh, in Maine. It can be difficult to see the antenna, but surprisingly, I would notice that even when the loon was about eight to 10 feet underwater, I could still pick up the signal. It broadcasted several miles. And we followed loons. They would swim several miles a day. They, they never flew. They consistently use the same area. This is out in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. And at night, they would go out in the middle of the ocean and form large rafts. So they basically would move offshore. And some of these rafts we came across might be 50, 100, or 200 individuals, which is really just, just, just awesome to see. Now this loon looks off and you take a closer look at it and you'd realize yeah, it's molting its feathers. It's replacing its wing feathers. So they do this during the winter time, typically January, February, maybe into March. It takes about two to three weeks to complete the molt, at which point they're flightless. But at this point, loons, their first thought of escape, right, is to swim underwater, is not to fly. So for them to be flightless isn't a real concern for their survival, for example. One of the things that I, I was able to notice when it's spending time down in the Gulf of Mexico is that loons will form fairly large rafts. There was one, we wrote up a paper, we had over 600 individuals. So think about that, like how crazy is that? But they'll form large rafts. And what they're doing is they're feeding on schooling fish. So there's menhaden, for example, alewives, herring, and these schooling fish just really conform well to loons working together to corral these fish and increase their individual foraging success. So that's mostly a hypothesis that we don't have strong data for that, but it seems like it's a fairly good working hypothesis at this point. So I just have this picture in here because there's two loons in the bottom left and two cormorants on the top. This is in the Gulf of Mexico. And I was doing some research down there and lo and behold, when I'm following loons, I come across a bottlenose dolphin. Now, you may have surmised I'm an ornithologist by training. Sure, I love birds, but can, can we not love cetaceans and bottlenose dolphins? And can you imagine studying loons and dolphins? Like, are you kidding? Like, sure, I'll go down. Hey, I'd have to tell my family. It's like, no, I, I have to go down and do research in the Gulf. It's real serious work we're doing. And I'm seeing dolphins and loons interacting every day. Like, how awesome is that? And I have an excerpt in the book, and uh, I, I won't read it. Um, essentially, I'll just tell you the short paraphrasing of the chapter. But I was watching a dolphin one day swimming towards shore, and it was kind of fluking just like a dolphin would. And it seemed to be like hunting and schooling, pushing fish towards shore. And what I noticed the loon doing is the loon got in the wake behind the dolphin. And when the fish were trying to escape the dolphin, the loon was picking up the fish behind the dolphin in its wake. And how incredible was that to witness that, uh, you know, being a biologist here in Maine or Wisconsin, to see that in the Gulf of Mexico was just a treat. And so again, usually naturalists, we see things because we're outdoors and things happen. Okay, another tool we can use is you're looking at a metal band that has a unique identify, identifying number on it, but above that, there's a depth pressure sensor. And that's attached to another band. And that costs about $400 to put on a loon. So you can, you have to recatch the loon, take that off. You can download the data and it will give you a depth profile. It'll let you know how, how deep that loon was diving. And so this work was uh, 
done in Lake Michigan. And you're looking at the, when the balloons were at Lake Michigan, what they were doing is they were diving. This is uh, meters below the surface, so 40 to 40 meters. It, all from nine in the morning to three in the afternoon, the balloons were consistently diving down 120 to 150 feet and resurfacing and constantly going up and down. And so they're probably feeding on bottom dwelling fish such as goby in Lake Michigan. But the fact that that's what loons were doing is their hunting strategy was really fascinating to learn. It wasn't just diving 10 or 20 feet. They were like committed, almost like sperm whales are committed to going after giant squid. They fall asleep for an hour and go all the way down to the bottom. That's almost what loons were doing, right? Loons were just diving all the way to the bottom, not wasting any time, looking probably for goby and then surfacing. Another technique and tool we can use are satellite transmitters. Now, most of us are probably familiar with satellite transmitters that were put on an albatross, peregrine falcon, or a bald eagle. Those are solar powered and work really well. We, we cannot put a solar backpack on a loon. So we tried and we learned very quickly that was not gonna happen. That was gonna upset the hydrodynamic design. Loons are wild and just loathed anything that was on them and they just swam right to shore and beached themselves. And we're like, okay, we, after a couple tries, we, we can't do this. So we needed to do some kind of internal implant, for example. And over time, we, we figured out the, the wildlife vets, the best place to do that. So it's kind of usually a sub-abdominal implant. And here's an antenna sticking out from the loon. A satellite transmitter cost about $2,000 to give you an idea. Then you have to play with the data and you have to pay for time to download those data. That might be $500 to $1,000 to give you an example. But you also have to pay for a wildlife vet to do the surgery, so their time, their effort, so before you long, you can see it's $5,000 easy just to put out one satellite transmitter. So, but that's very useful information we could get. And a story I'm gonna tell you, and I kind of go into a little more depth on it in the book, is in 1998, Dave and I were asked to come out to Walker Lake, Nevada to try to catch loons. And so Walker Lake is a high desert lake in the Great Basin Desert. It's 40 miles long by 10 or 11 miles wide. Very impressive lake. It's about an hour and a half from Reno and four hours from Vegas, four or five hours from Vegas. So I've kind of circled it there near the town of Hawthorne. That's Walker Lake. And there was a ballad written about Walker Lake. So in the springtime, loons stop at Walker Lake, over a thousand individuals. You can see some are further along molting into their breeding plumage and some are breeding into their breeding plumage. And so the question was, where did these loons go? And to try to raise awareness about the plight of Walker Lake, a group of researchers at Boise State University, the Nevada Fish and Department of Wildlife, Game and Wildlife assisted in this project, and the University of Wisconsin, uh, the USGS office in La, La Crosse with Kevin Kenow came over to try to put satellite transmitters in these loons to figure out where they went. And the reason they were stopping there is this fish here, Tui Chub and Lahontan cutthroat trout are native fish of just the right size and perfect for loons. So literally over a thousand loons would stop there. And so we were trying to put out some satellite transmitters. So the story gets quite complex in the book. I will try to distill it for you in a nutshell. As we had a lot of moving parts, a lot of money involved, a lot of time and energy. And when we got there, the satellite transmitters were not in hand, just delay. And they were gonna come the next day, like on Tuesday morning, and we arrived on Monday. On Monday, we heard was the best day to go out because Tuesday through Thursday were high winds. And this is a desert area where winds could get really volatile. And so we're like, well, let's go out the first night and see what we can catch because we've never really caught loons during migration. So we weren't sure whether we were gonna be successful because the adults are not with their chicks. So rather than parental instinct keeping them on the surface, they could simply just dive if they felt like it. So you might notice the difference here, bigger boat, much longer handle, right? Because we're gonna have to stretch further to catch those loons. And what happened? So we ended up catching five loons that first night and we were trying to decide what to do 
And ultimately we concluded we should try to keep three loons to put satellite transmitters. They were gonna arrive the next morning. And so we ended up you know, trying to keep the loons, like we had to put them in our hotel room. Like we didn't tell the hotel manager, but we brought loons in us into the hotel. We had them in a box. We had a life preserver. We were trying to and punched holes in the boxes for air. And we even put one in the bathtub at one point to see what would happen, which is kind of comical in a way. But the loon did really fine. We stayed up with the loons all night. The transmitters arrived. Everything was fine at the end of the day. And where the decision got interesting too is the winds were so high Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday that we were never able to go out in the field. So if we would have decided to put those loons back, we would never would have collected the data. So this is the surgery. And from Walker Lake, these birds, you can see it from April to May ended up in Northwest Saskatchewan. And the story could end there, but almost unfathomably something extraordinary happened. So 12 years later, I'm catching loons in the Gulf of Mexico. These are my coworkers and colleague, Darwin Long. We're gonna catch some loons at random in the Gulf of Mexico and put satellite transmitters in them. So this is March, 2011. So this is 12, 13, 13 years later, actually. I said, so 13, we catch two couple loons at random. We put satellite transmitters in them and now we're gonna track them. Well, the first one, interesting enough, off the coast of Louisiana, goes to a reservoir in Tennessee, spends 15 days at Lake Michigan, six days at Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba, ends up going to Saskatchewan, 2,309 miles, 52 days later, right? So almost a two month spring migration. So we catch another bird. What does that bird do? Well, that bird spends nine days at this reservoir in North Carolina. It was nine days in Chesapeake Bay, 12 days at Lake Erie, 10 days at Lake Huron, two to three days in Lake Winnipeg, and oh my gosh, Northwest Saskatchewan, 2,776 miles. So I'm looking at these data and I'm thinking, remember Walker Lake? That was 13 years ago, we, we caught these birds, like doesn't that look pretty similar? So we, we plotted this and the dashed lines are the birds from Walker Lake, the solid lines are the birds from Louisiana. And it looks like sure enough in Northwest Saskatchewan, they overlap. So we zoomed in on that. And instead of dashed lines, it's the thin lines are the birds from Walker Lake. And the thick line is the birds from Louisiana. And you can see at Peter Pond Lake, they actually overlap. And if you zoom in more, they literally use the same lake 13 years apart, but two birds in random in Walker Lake, Nevada. You know, we actually caught three birds and a couple of birds random caught off Louisiana, both converged in Northwest Saskatchewan and overlapped. And it was just extraordinarily like that. You, I don't know if you can make that up. Like the odds of that happening are extraordinarily slim. And it really told us that the population in the West overlaps and probably with the population in the Gulf of Mexico in Saskatchewan. Okay, we did put some satellite transmitters on some birds in Maine. So relevant to folks you know, on this call for the most part. And what we find, for example, is that the squares were birds caught in the uh, breeding area. And in the winter time, what did we find? So Aziskahas Lake male stayed pretty much like Booth Bay Harbor, Scudic Peninsula, and the female was down south of Cape Cod, so different area. And then the Flagstaff male was off Booth Bay Harbor, for example, and the female was down off the coast of Maryland. So the same pair, same water bodies, but males and females wintered in different locations. And of interest, females migrated further. Now that was a small sample size, so I, I probably wouldn't read too much into that. But we were able to get the satellite transmitters to work for two years for some of the birds. And this is the data and the gray line, the gray, darker gray is one year. And the lighter circles inside that is the second year. And you can see that literally the birds came back to the same location in consecutive winters and wintered in the same areas. And so essentially that's saying that if you walk along the coast in Maryland and see a loon or two, those are probably the same individuals year after year. And similarly off the coast of Maine.
So then you can put out videos and cameras and see what they catch. And so here's a loon getting off a nest up in Rangeley Lakes area. You can see the bands are there. There's the two eggs and probably a nest exchange, for example, taking place. Now this is up at Rangeley again. Notice the, the nest seems to be away from the water. A big wave came from a boat and flooded the nest, washed the eggs away. And that shows you the importance of a no wake zone near loon nest, right? If you get too close to a loon nest, they can flood and wash out. Here's a mink walking the shoreline when the loon's incubating at night. This is a river otter checking out the shore. Here's Fido. When you thought Fido would be fine, actually could cause problems. Here's a moose just walking the shoreline. The loon, of course, lowers its head, but just to see that juxtaposition of a big loon and, and, a, and a moose is really, really interesting. Now here's one for you behind the loon, you might notice a subadult bald eagle. What happens? Well, this eagle attacks and the loon just gets off with escaping. So still cameras, video, really useful information as well. Other toolkits would be genetics. So usually as a biologist, if that's not my training, I'm gonna connect with the geneticist, sequence the DNA, we've collected the blood, we have feathers, and what do we find out? Well, the part of the story is loons have low genetic diversity. And I suspect reasons for that is in the last 20 million years, as glaciers have advanced and retreated, the loons range had to retract as well. And you'll notice in the Southwest and Southeast, there's not as many lakes. So I think the breeding population was called and shrank considerably and has rebounded from that. And so conservation biologists call this the bottleneck effect. We see this in cheetah, uh, elephant seals, and some other populations as well. I suspect this is probably what happened in loons as well. So I talk about that in the book as well. Okay, so who's the loon's nearest neighbors? Well, again, looking at genetics and DNA sequencing, penguins are the nearest neighbors and they probably shared a common ancestor 50 to 55 million years ago. So what we're saying is loons and penguins are highly specialized and have been going separate ways for a long, long time, separate and apart from other birds. Okay, the last uh, tool we can use is translocation. And we actually tried this experiment in 2014 and 2017 in Minnesota where we moved chicks from northern Minnesota, released them in pens in southern Minnesota, just to see, is it even possible as a conservation strategy? And so I worked on this project for multiple years. We identified a few lakes that would be great potential breeding lakes in southern Minnesota for loons. This is Fish Lake. These were the pens, the enclosures we put out. Uh, we fed the chicks, we released them. We caught the chicks when they were about six, seven weeks of age. So they were old enough where they weren't completely dependent on their parents for food. And physiologically, we felt they were in a better position as well. This is the first chick that was ever released at 4.35 in the morning on August 15th. I kind of released it from the canoe and almost tipped, but there's that chick and it was really fascinating. So the story, there's different phases of this, this project. There was a New York um, so to Massachusetts. Part three is Maine to Massachusetts. And if you haven't heard of the story in a nutshell, a, loon that, a chick that was moved from New York and released in Pockshaw Pond in Massachusetts, returned there multiple years and then neighbored, uh, bred with a neighbor on a neighboring lake and successfully produced young in 2020. So that's potentially suggesting translocation of loons might be a, a conservation strategy should the need arise, for example. All right, so I think I've taken a little longer and I'm gonna get through this in about five minutes and then we can do some uh, questions. So let's just talk about the anatomy of loons. Uh, and once loons became divers, Right, they went on a different trajectory. Other birds, it's all about aerodynamics, flight. For a loon, my first concern is can I catch food and can I get to escape from predators? So loon is all about being hydrodynamically designed to be torpedo shaped. 
to be streamlined, maximize efficiency, and minimize drag, for example. So when you look at a loon, it's very narrow. Its wings are narrow. They're pressed close to the body. If the wings stuck out, they would create drag and turbulence and slow them down. So loons lack crest feathers. Everything about them is sleek, for example. And the other thing that's unique is their vert vertebral column comes at literally straight on. And if you compare that to another bird of prey, like an eagle or a raptor, that's more of 90 degrees. So our neck comes into our skull at about 90 degrees. And what we're saying with the loon and diving birds, that's literally 180 degrees. So that's kind of position has rotated and shifted. And that essentially makes the, the bird skull more streamlined. Chopsticks, cranial kinesis is the terminology. So loons have the ability to not quite disarticulate their bills like the lower jaw of a snake can, but it does have greater range and mobility to allow it to open up its bill fairly wide to swallow larger food. So cranial kinesis is the terminology for that. And if we're looking at some anatomy on a loon, sure, their heads are large and heavy. So it's like adding a weight that's gonna help the loon get to the bottom quicker because it has a big heavy head leading. The shoulders are narrow, the hips are extraordinarily narrow, the legs are lengthened and elongated, the digits, all to maximize propulsion and minimize drag. I think of the feet as being like canoe paddles. In one direction, they create a big blade, big surface area, and then on the return stroke, they're very narrow. And I think this picture depicts that. So the loon's legs are very flattened like a canoe paddle, and on the re return stroke, it's very narrow, so it minimizes drag, for example. So now we're looking at the breastplate of a loon, so the sternum. And we're looking at a dorsal view and a lateral view. The lateral view is of, of interest because the keel that we're looking at that bottom picture is very narrow on a loon. And that doesn't leave room for mu muscles to attach to. So this is a pigeon. And notice the keel is extraordinarily large, so lots of muscle can attach there. So the trade-off for a loon, right, is if they had a big keel, they'd have bigger muscles, but then it would affect their efficiency in the water swimming, right? So they having a very narrow streamline breastplate doesn't leave much room for muscle. So consequently, there's like a disproportion, there's a little disconnect. So we recognize that, that in order for a loon to get lift, it needs to run a long way in order to generate enough power because the chest muscles are not as large to support powered flight. So typically a two to 400 meter runway. Now, when you're looking at the loon wing, you see how narrow it is. So that low surface area to body weight means that if that loon stops flapping, it's gonna start falling to the earth, right? So in order to stay in flight, the loons need to beat their wings rapidly, several hundred beats per minute, and consequently they fly very fast, 70 to 75 miles per hour. And that's all because heavy body weight and very narrow wings, their surface area just can't support them, like a Canada goose, for example. And uh, this is near the last uh, table for you guys to look at. And what we're looking at is that the flight ability translates to how far loons migrate. So in other words, if you're in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and you're flying 1,500 miles to the Gulf of Mexico, you are 20 to 25, 30% smaller than a loon that's from New York or Maine or New Hampshire that only flies a short distance to the ocean. So these are body weights. The second column is body mass, females and males. And if we just look at female weight, you can see it gets larger as you get towards the coast. And males, which are 20 to 25% larger than females, has, shows that same pattern, that males in New Hampshire average 6,000 grams, uh, which is a very, very large bird. And Maine and New Hampshire are very comparable, for example. Okay, so that's it. And I just, I can say acknowledgments forever. I've worked with many wonderful biologists where I feel extraordinarily blessed and uh, just really touching. So these, I've worked with 52 biologists for at least a week. So each of these biologists worked for a week. So this is like years of this. And I've had 248 volunteers I've worked with 
and they have worked with me for a week. So anyone less than a week, I didn't include you. And just to give you an idea of just the, the amount of effort has just been extraordinary. And a lot of my funding came from a group in Boston called Earthwatch Institute. Some of you may have heard about it uh, and very grateful for them for supporting my research over the time. Uh, I have to thank the loan, right? To keep us all inspired. And these are my good friends who took the majority of all the photo credits as well. Uh, there's my website if you wanted to look for the book or something like that. It's all good. So folks, I can't see if anybody's sleeping out there. I'm assuming you stayed awake. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Jim. That was great. We do have some questions in the chat box, and I think we have one or one or two people who have raised their hand. So Julia and I will just kind of start um, asking some of the questions, and maybe we'll get through a few questions in the chat box, and then I'll um, let some people ask their questions to you directly. Does that sound good? Sure. Okay. Um, so one question I see here is, um, are man-made loon rafts a good idea, safer from predators? What about boat waves? Yeah, I, I think, I, you know, with you think with I've had a fair amount of practice with this, I'd be able to answer these questions in about 30 seconds, and I should probably answer in 30 seconds and move on. But some of these things are multi multi tiered complex questions, and some sometimes yes nos don't work. But the fact that humans have encroached on loon habitat, right, and we've altered nesting locations for them, we've minimized. It only seems. Uh, you know, like we, we could, if we can kind of put out rafts that might help them breed, I, I think that's completely a fair thing in terms of trying to provide that for loons. And I think then the question about boats, I think we, we can just alert people to the fact that loons are nesting. And if we just can slow down near those rafts, they would be perfectly fine. And I've seen places that Lakes have put out educational information and most boaters adhere to it. And it's kind of a win-win across everybody because people who love loons care about loons, educate others about loons. And we're not just not thinking about ourselves when we're on the boats, we're thinking about other animals, which is a you know, more holocentric viewpoint, which is a good thing at the end of the day. So hopefully Landier, I, I answered the question. Thank you, that's perfect. So I see a couple um, that tie together. One one was how can you tell the difference visually from males to females if the, if you can? And actually, an earlier question while you were um, talking about your banding to identify individuals, uh, someone asked if there was a uh, you know quote non invasive way um, like visually based off of their um, necklace mm -hmm. zebra patterns or or the like. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And um, so really good. So Julia, just, I just had a little moment. What was that first question again? Um, particularly about visually identifying yes. males versus females. Yeah. Right, thank, thank you. So when I watch a pair of loons over time, I feel increasing confidence in my ability to separate males from females. And it's based solely on size. So after watching them, males are 25% larger. And I'll give you something that you, everybody mostly can relate to. Canada geese, there's that same sexual dimorphism. Male Canada geese are 25% larger than females. The neck is thicker, the bill. I can look at a Canada goose and I know who's the male, who's the female like that. And I can do that with loons. Like literally it gets to be that easy. That works if it's the same pair, you know, hour after hour, day after day. Now. That being said, loons have air sacs and their feathers have high melanin concentrations. They're very thick, almost like a woodpecker feather because they're gonna take their body and squeeze that air sacs and eliminate any air in their body as they submerge. So loon has the ability to alter how much they're squeezing those air sacs. So what I'm getting at is a male could look smaller than a female if it's decided to squeeze its air sacs and if the female relaxed its feathers, it might sit taller. So that's where it gets a little complex, but that's, that's kind of what can come into play. 
And I absolutely love the question that the person provided. Is there another way visually that we can separate loons? And I, I, I would love to have a, a definitive answer on that. It gets, it gets really hard. So the, some, I know someone tried some facial recognition software that the FBI used, I think on loons at some point, and had a hard time getting a definitive answer about that. And what happens is they're changing their feather feathers fairly frequently. And, and even that necklace, we, we're, we're not there yet in terms of being able to just get a picture of that necklace. But I wish we could like whales and it would make things a, a potentially simpler and a little less invasive. And I think a fair question would be, you know, do the bands hurt the loons in any way? And all we know is that we've put out 5,000. We've never had any mortality. These birds are wearing the same bands 10, 20, 30 years later. If there were consequences, serious side effects, we would have seen that, right? So, and I think the reason it's probably not as big as issue is most of the drag is occurring after the recovery stroke on the band. If, that, if they had something, a neck collar, I would say, and that was the first thing entering the water, that might cause more disturbance. But the fact that the bands are so far back, I think it really minimizes kind of the hydrodynamic turbulence that's generated. And, um, but boy, I would really love to do that. And, and maybe I should really try to pursue that question. I did it 10 years ago and it, it would be fascinating to find that out. So thank you for asking that. Thank you, Jim. Um, we have more questions coming in, a couple more that tie together. Somebody's wondering um, about what are the greatest threats to loons? And then a question that's somewhat related is, are loons hunted as food and are they protected during hunting season? Yeah, so loons aren't hunted as food. They're protected by the Migratory Bird Act. And so for the most part, they're, they're safe. And uh, they were they were hunted in the early 1800s for a bit, mostly for sport because they're fast on the wing. And a few people that were, I've read excerpts have tried loons, described their flesh as being very fishy and foul tasting as one might su su you know, guess. So that's kind of the interactions there. Did, did I, Landy, was there another question that I miss? Um, I just like a part of that one was, um, what are some of the biggest threats to loons? Which I, I, I think you mentioned maybe some a little bit already, but if you just talk about that a bit more. Sure, so I, I think you, we can kind of look at it from different scales. Like one of them is like in the breeding grounds, what are some major threats, for example? And sometimes human recreational pressure, human encroachment can, can be problematic at times. There's you know more collisions, uh, fishing gear, lead, this is, can be problematic, uh, of course. Uh, on the, during migration, uh, you know, botulism in some areas, there's different outbreaks of botulism, which could be problematic. In the winter time, you know, loons do get caught in commercial fishnets or, or, or gill nets. Now, potentially maybe not as many and more like red-throated loons than common loons. But, but loons do get caught in nets, you know, probably several hundred every year. Oil spills, marine oil spills can be problematic. And I think the question that a lot of us are interested in and we're, and we're vested and we just don't know the answer is how, how is climate change really gonna affect all of this? And I, I, what I wanna offer people as well is that most of us are thinking about freshwater systems. Lakes become more turbid, might change fish population. How's that going to affect loons? How fast are they gonna be able to catch food for themselves and provide for the young? But also in the winter as ocean temperatures change, fish distributions may change. How might that change with loons? And I think that's a great unknown and something that you know, a lot of people are, have invested interest in. Thank you. Do you wanna, um... Are there still folks raising their hands, Lander? Do we want to do? Yeah, I do still see two hands. So um, it looks like Deborah, if you would still like to ask a question, I'm going to um, 
allow you to talk. I think you just have to unmute yourself. Okay, I think I think you're unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Looks like she said in the chat she's all set. Oh, okay. Um, okay, awesome. So sorry about that, Deborah. I'm gonna now um, see if Sharon would like to ask her question. Sharon, if you're still interested, you can. Uh... Oh, hi. Um, I'm on Little Sebago Lake, um, not very far from where Jim resides and works. Um, and one thing that I wondered if Jim could speak to is we, this past season, have had reports of several instances of looms that have been um, icebound and had to be rescued. And amazingly, we've had some um, fire departments that have gone out on very thin ice to rescue looms. And it's, there's, there's been half a dozen of these occurrences in um, the media and social media just this past winter. And it seems that those looms were um, iced in uh, because they had begun molting. And why they stayed long enough to be molting is, is a mystery. And I, I, I wonder if, if Jim, you could, you could talk to that. And was there anything particular about this winter that would have created this phenomenon? Um, and then I, I guess the only other thing is that uh, somebody had dug up um, and I did not fact check it um, that like a hundred years ago, this same sort of phenomena occurred in one odd season uh, where there were hundreds of loons that were ice bound. Um, any thoughts, Jim? Hey, thank you, Sharon, for, um, yeah, for joining today and for sharing your thoughts on that. And if anything, Sharon, you've generated more questions, which is what a good question might do. And uh, I, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I can speculate probably as well as the next person uh, what might, might be going on. And the, the one thing that strikes us is, you know, is this just an aberration or is this a pattern, right? So we're kind of looking at science that's probably the first thing that I'd like to know, is this just an aberrant year or is this something more of a pattern? And I, what, I, what I'm trying to do research right now, Sharon and the group, is I'm trying to look at distributions of loons in the winter over the last 20, 30 years. And so we're looking at generating a program to look at, look at software to see how loons, have they shifted kind of where they're just uh, spending time in the winter. So we know, for example, loons are now wintering in Massachusetts all winter long. That didn't, play, that didn't take place 10 years ago. So loons are staying in Massachusetts, a subset, and before those lakes would freeze over, but they're not freezing over. So that's one of the aspects with, as, as the climate's kind of altering that we might see loons potentially maybe not leaving. And I think that's probably what's happening in lakes like even in Vermont and possibly New Hampshire and even Maine is potentially the signal is not, is, that's not happening. And I think if you're a loon, it probably is in your best interest to migrate, right? And, but if there's a subset that don't migrate and you're already there and there's food, why undergo migration? So really fascinating. And I wanna follow through on Sharon too, just about the condition of those birds. Uh, I'm gonna ask a few, I'm gonna ask around about the condition of those birds. I did not hear about that, the molting. And that to me doesn't fit with everything I know about the physiology of the loon, that doesn't fit. So I don't know if that's, if that's true. So that's where fact checking will come into play. Because physiologically, they shouldn't be something, something seems a little off. So I, I'd like to check that. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. So how's that? Landa, you're muted. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, 
one of, we, we have other questions in the chat box and we are coming up on time here. So I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. But um, one question here that I thought could be helpful maybe is what can individuals do to support the loon population? Yeah, I think along those lines, just one, staying well read uh, and working with like, you know, Maine Audubon or so your, your local lake association, getting involved with that is, is probably one of the best things you can do. They're always looking for volunteers to help out monitor the loons, for example. So that would be a great way to spend one time is find out who's doing uh, the, the counts on the lake, who's doing the monitoring and offer your services. Awesome, thank you. Um, Julia, do you see any other questions that we should try and make time for? I'd love to make time for everyone's questions, but we might not be able to. I know, I actually have been um, taking these down and so maybe we can give them to Jim to, to answer for us later. We could post it with the video. Um, there's been a few questions about uh, lures and lead, so fishing impacts. Um, one question was, do loons take lures? Um, maybe, I don't know, say if they're swimming by and, and see one. And, or, and then the separate question was, um, has there been evidence of less lead poisoning since the um, uh, implementation of, you know, not using lead sinkers or, or weights in, in fishing gear? Yeah, I am aware of the first, first one is that they will sometimes pursue a lure. So they'll, they'll get fooled as well. So that can happen. And I have not seen the most recent data on whether there's been a, a significant change. And so um, that's something I, I certainly would like to follow up on, but I, I'm not sure the answer to that. Great. Well, Jim, what do you think? Would you like to do a couple more questions or are we, do we want to wrap it up? I think... How about we, the spirit of maybe one more and then call it good? I've got uh, something else I'm attending to. Absolutely. Landry, you wanna go ahead? Um, sure, let's see. Um, do young loons join together in large groups near migration time? Someone um, has seen this behavior before. Yeah, I'd like to see you know, more data on that topic for sure. And that's again where citizen science is really useful and folks who get out in the field and pay attention, taking photographs is really useful, getting that to the right people to look at it. Uh, and I think with loons, because they're so visible and identifiable that there's a lot we can learn and citizen scientists can really contribute to our knowledge in a great way. Uh, I've seen young loons gather as well, uh, but also with adults. And there's still a lot of open-ended questions there that we could use more data on. So what the, uh, the question asked was, was gonna be really useful stuff for us. Awesome, thank you, Jim. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I just wanna let people know who are still on that um, Jim has kindly allowed us to record this. Um, so it will go up on the Blue Hair Distrust YouTube channel, which will then be um, there'll be a link on the Island Heritage Trust and the Blue Heritage Trust website if you would like to watch this again or share it with a friend. Um, and we hope you all have a good night. And thank you so much, Jim. That was really fabulous. Sure thing. Really Thanks, fabulous. Julie, appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody for tuning in. Take care. Bye, Bye everybody.